So, as the Persians invaded and crashed upon the waves of the Mediterranean on the Greek coast, their armies laid in shambles, and a new stage had been set. New ideas were beginning to arise, and old orders were crumbling and falling to the side. The torch of culture began to pass from the old power of Egypt and the far or the Central East, I guess, to the new Greek polis structure. This is most evident in a couple of pieces. The one that we're going to look at today, which we could go into a lot more detail than we're going to. Maybe I'll do that eventually, but for now, I just want to introduce you to the idea of the Credios boy. So, what is the Credios boy? First, we're going to have to take a look at ancient Egyptian sculpture to see where it came from. As I've mentioned, ancient Egypt was the standard setter for a lot of artistic concepts in the ancient era. Their building and especially their manufacture of sculptures and of various statues became the standard in much of the Mediterranean. That being said, they weren't very good at conveying real positions or real ways of being, and this meant that a lot of the areas that copied this style had the same problems. They started from a flawed position and had to move forward into realism through various means. The Egyptian style was very known for either being a standing sculpture or a bust, and they would stand with their hands by their side, their shoulders and their hips perfectly straight, their neck just a little bit turned, just like this. And one thing that you might notice about this is it's very uncomfortable and it's awkward and this isn't the way that a person stands. This is a way that an ancient Egyptian statue stands. This was a problem that really showed the lack of knowledge and the lack of development in a lot of areas in the ancient ways. One of the main points that needed to be addressed was human anatomy. We looked a little bit at how artists helped to understand and facilitate the development of anatomy in a previous episode with art and with painting, but now we're going to take a look at how the need for anatomy and understanding human locomotion played a huge role in the art and the sculpture that was generated by ancient Greece. The dominant style, as I stated, made a mockery of what the human form was, and because of this, the stone couldn't be supported either. A lot of artists at the time probably thought that the stone just couldn't perfectly look like a person because they were made from two different things, but they were missing some very integral points. Um, a person alone couldn't stand in one of these rough, rigid positions for a very long time, so why you would assume that stone should be able to either is a little bit crazy, but the ancient Greeks brought in this system and they began to take a look at it. At the beginning in the 6th, 7th, 6th, 5th centuries uh, BC, very early, they would do very, very, very similar style to the Egyptians, but something began to change around the 5th and 4th century BC, and some very important developments began to arise. One of the best points is the Credios boy. Uh, we're going to take a look at this picture, and I'm going to leave it up a little bit longer than usual. There's a lot of things that I want to point out that you might not notice right away. So first off, let's see how it compares to the Egyptian. It still faces forward. The right leg is still out front. The head is still slightly cocked to the right. The hands are down by the sides. But there's some very important, subtle kind of things that we need to look at. The neck and the head and the shoulders and the waist. All of these points are rotated. 
They are not rigidly in place. They are not a straight line across. They are moving. They are in motion. They show the transition of the body as it supports itself against the ground, the way that a real person does. This is the beginning of mimesis coming to the forefront in ancient Greek sculpture. So before we wrap up, I want to do a thought experiment similar to how we've usually done to get a closer look at how this innovation would have played out, what it would have meant to develop techne and to exhibit mimesis in your works. And there is no finer ancient Greek artist to pick than the great Praxiteles. Fun name, lots of X's in the Greek language. So you are the great Praxiteles and you find your home in Athens around the 4th or 3rd century BC. That is a major city producing lots of culture, lots of ceramics, paintings, sculptures, buildings. It is on the cusp of a proto-renaissance, you could say, moving from the old ways and the imported ways of producing and styling art to a new and fresh perspective. As a young and ambitious artist, you want to produce the greatest works and the most aesthetic looking things, so you decide that you need to refine your skill and figure out how to produce something that can really be a medium between a person and a feeling. You have seen the ancient Egyptian sculpture and style, and you mock it for its lack of clarity, its lack of realism, its lack of mimesis. These pieces, as new ideas and new concepts would have arised, would have seemed more and more poor and less aesthetically pleasing. And as an artist yourself, you look upon them with some disdain, but you aren't quite sure yet what it is that you need to do to surpass the old ways. You have heard of the Credios Boy and the trend that it started. Now there were slightly moved necks and some other areas that made these statues a little bit more lifelike, but still they are all standing straight up, they are all looking to the right. You decide to go to the original and to look at what started this trend to see if you can do something to go beyond it. It's going to be a bit of a trek and it's going to be a lot of work to look at this, but you decide that the only way to further refine your own skill is to stand on the shoulders of the giants before you. So you head up to the great work to take a look and to see how their work makes you feel the level of mimesis and the skill that went into it. It's been about a century since the original Credios boy and your arrival on the artistic scene and it's come to encompass much of what Greek art now means. It's a step above the old Egyptian ways, so it's a bit more authentic to the Greek people, but at the same time, at the end of the day, all that most of these artists are doing is recreating something that's already been done a century earlier. You want to go further. You don't just want to stop at the same point that everyone else has. So you decide to look at what it is exactly that this Kredios Boy statue has that made it stand out and what it is that you could do to influence the scene in a similar way to the original Kredios himself. First, you come in, you take a look, you try to notice a lot of the elements that are new. The first things that you see are that it really isn't that different from the old style. Still front facing, still standing, still quite rigid, but there are some points of contact which help to reduce and uh, eliminate a bit of the rigidity. The rotation at the head, the rotation at the neck, the rotation of the shoulders and the hips allows for the statue to almost feel as if it's standing there rather than being placed on the ground like a column. The way that the stone responds to the proper moving and distribution of the weight 
mimics the effect of the human body and the real weight that the flesh carries over the bones. This produces a much more stable and a much more fresh look at how to build sculpture. So these points of rotation seem to be very important and the concept of distribution of weight because if all of the weight is being pulled straight down and you have uneven areas or some areas thicker than others then it's naturally not going to stand all that long. The human body stands, moves, and adjusts the way that it does because it has to. If we weren't properly able to move our weight and to properly distribute throughout our structure by moving, by leaning, by the joints that we have, the hips, the neck, the head, the shoulders, we would be very limited in our scope of movement. And much more than that, we use these things every time that we move. There is no point where you move from one rigid position to another without some sort of fluidity. So you decide to take the good elements that you see and you decide that this statue while being an improvement and having a truer mimesis than previous works still could use a good amount of improvement what is there left that you can do though the joints have already begun to move the arms are beginning to move the head has been tilted in a way that hasn't Today, it seems pretty obvious by our standards what could happen and how it could develop, but you are the great Praxiteles, and you live in an era when no one has thought about this yet. You decide that the improvement in the distribution of weight and the joints is very important, and that's something that you're actually going to focus on. More than the subject and the person and the idea, you want to focus on the way that it stands, the way that it moves, and the way that it imposes itself on a room as compared to a real person and their real anatomy. So, done with your consultations and your investigations of older art, it is now time for you to produce something with true techne and mimesis. You decide first to start simple. Everybody's been orienting these to the right, and you decide that a big change, which a lot of people will notice, is to move things to the left. A couple of Praxiteles early works have the head and the body looking left as the shoulders are moved, which actually looks a lot more natural than the way that the others were doing. Honestly, the innovation that happened with the Credios boys still wasn't all that realistic in and of itself, and Praxiteles just took the simple elements that had been added and stretched them as close to reality as possible. The more natural posturing, the left-leaning, the body being oriented, and importantly, the arms being outstretched. This is difficult because it requires all of the joints in the arms to be properly located and to be properly represented. This suspension of the arms is one of the reasons why a lot of these statues no longer have them. They weren't sculpted properly to scale, and they fell off at some point. Uh, it's a problem that was overcome with time and with a lot of dedication, but you're the great Praxiteles, and you're the first to do it. So that is the important uh, part that we're going to focus on here. Next is even more important. You decide not only to do a different subject, just about all sculpture up to this point had been men and all anatomical sculpture up to this point had been men. So this time you're not only going to do a left-facing sculpture that contrasts with the common style, you're also going to do a woman, a beautiful woman, Venus Aphrodite herself. You decide that it should have a little bit more oomph though than your last one. So instead of simply being standing and leaning to the left as opposed to all of the other sculptures, you have it leaning a little bit more and you try to really accentuate the joints, the hips and the shoulders 
which are more dramatic and more evident on the female form than on the male form. This leads to a huge uprising and a cultural shift in the way that these images are conveyed. There's only one problem though. You face one final hurdle. The body is shifted a little too much and the joints aren't perfect and the statue doesn't actually freely stand on its own. There's a support that's going to be needed and this will detract from the overall beauty of the piece and sort of wreck the mimesis that you're trying to impart into the viewer. You decide, as a great and intelligent person, to put this support but cover it with a highly intricate and ornate sculpture of a sheet which hangs down at her side. You'll see on the picture there's a little joint that attaches from her leg to the pillar which is behind the sheet. This is to give support, and as artists in the ancient Greek era got closer and closer to producing real sculptures that were so true in their mimesis that they could literally stand as a person on their own, they had to add these joints, these supports, and these columns. Praxiteles is special in this regard that even though he has a support column and he has this infrastructure on this piece, he hid it and he made it part of the piece rather than being a separate or uh, something that you can look at and identify as not being true to scale. His ambition was tied to his innovation which showed a great amount of techne. And not only that, with his desire for mimesis and his techne, he sculpted some of the first art to truly imitate life which was a common thread for the next thousand, two thousand years, with this one great work, you, the great Praxiteles, have set the bar for Western art. What is aesthetics? What the Greeks find to be art, culture, and important in their own societies. And you have set the bar for all future artists for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed, I hope that you learned something new. This one was much more detailed, I didn't get to cover a lot of topics, so we're going to have to come back here again soon, probably in season 4, if we get that far, let's see how we do. Uh, I just wanted to say, if you enjoyed the video, uh, you could like the video, or if you want to get the latest content, you could subscribe, all my subscribers, see all that stuff first. If you have any comments, or if there's anything that you want to see in particular, any ideas you want to see explored, uh, leave them below and let me know. I do have a lot of this planned out, but I do also have mini-series, and that's something I want to talk about. I was doing the mini-series on the Silk Road, but I honestly think that doing two series at once was stretching me a little far with my day job and with all of that stuff. So. I decided to sort of tone it down until I got a little bit better footing on the main series. I didn't think I was putting enough effort into it, and I want to put in as much as I can to make the best points that I can. We will come back to On the Silk Road. I do want to do an extensive military history at some point. Like I said, if there's anything you guys want to see, let me know. And again, I hope that you enjoyed. I hope that I will see you again soon. But until next time, remember... Av Imperator.